Hello everybody, welcome to our top room. Uh, yes, there is anybody here, and it's me. I was just waiting for the for people who was a bit late to be able to come and get to the start. Before we start, as usually, I would like you to uh, tell me in the question tab whether you hear me well and whether you can see my screen well. Okay. Everybody says everything as well. Okay. So, yeah, we then will be starting. So, the topic, as you all might have noticed, is fault tolerance to node Hyper-V cluster with Starwind. We will move on to the next slide where you'll see the banner and the text you've seen on our website when you were registering. So, I don't think there's anything interesting here. That's me, I'm Olis. I'm a solutions engineer at Starwind, and I like my job. Uh, I like to have an opportunity to talk to you guys here, and I hope you like that as well. So we move on to the next uh, slide, yeah, and over here we see what we have, what, what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to back, uh, we are going to talk about Starwind devices. Uh, I will explain each setting, and then I'll show you the configuration in um, the configuration of Starwind with uh, hyperconverged Hyper-V. Uh, to start with that, we will need our virtual machine. Uh, I mean, not a virtual machine, but the Windows Server. Uh, which has Starwind installed on it, uh, installed, and over here, here's our Starwind console. We have a couple of devices here, uh, Remedy, Poison, Witness, Cluster Shared Volume, and we can imagine there's nothing here, and we'll just go ahead and create a new device. There are two options. You can choose Add Device Advanced or Add Device. Add Device will add your device with default settings. It will allow you to set the size and uh, configure its name, but Add Device Wizard will provide you with many more opportunities, and I prefer prefer this one. For here, we have a choice of a hard disk device, tap, uh, hard disk device tape device and optical disk drive. For cluster, we will need a hard disk device. Over here, we have a choice between RAM disk, physical disk, and virtual disk. Physical disk is a disk bridge, so you basically take your whole storage and export it, present it to Starwind. After that, Starwind uses it in whatever purposes. It depends on you. And virtual disk is do you make a virtual disk image file which resides on your physical RAID array and RAM disk is a virtual disk inside your random access memory. Uh, we're not going to build up a cluster on this one since if we reboot a host uh, all that all that information will get erased so we'll stick with a virtual disk on this option. Over here uh, some of you will notice that we changed a GUI a bit, and yes, we did. This is the version which uh, this is Starwind console, which should come should be released in a um, couple of weeks at max. Where here we have an opportunity to set the name. Let's call it uh, Taproom. Uh, we have an opportunity to configure path to that device. You can set it either here or here. Yeah, nothing is here. So we'll keep it here. Starwind devices. Tap room, we can set the size. One gig is enough. Or we can also use an existing one, but we don't have any. Here we have an option of going with thick provision devices and LSFS. LSFS is a log structured file system, and maybe we will have another tap room to talk about it. And now we have a configuration set up. We'll go with thin, th thin provision as for this option. Over here, there is another option which uh, which allows us to configure block size of this device. Uh, you, the default setting is 512, 
and it is uh, you said 512 only in case if you're working with Zen environment or VMware environment in case of this storage uh, if this storage will be presented to Windows only, you always go with 4096 block size. But you must understand that by choosing this uh, option here, it it will not allow you to work with uh, ESXi or Zen. Since we have Hyper-V here, we'll go with this option. This is cache. There is a write back and write through caching. Uh, write back is a recommended one for L1 cache. For L1 cache, we use random access memory. Write back increases your read and write performance, and write through increases your read performance only. So you choose one of those, you set its size, or you choose not active. I will go with not active since this is a test demo device and I don't think it will need any caching on it. Over here there is a option to specify L2 cache. It is SSD cache so we are using solid state drives for caching and then you can set to use them or to not. Uh, the system is configured on solid state drives so we actually don't need to use any other solid state drives, but in case if we had some faster solid state drives than this system is configured on, it actually would make sense. Over here we have an option to allow multiple connections, uh, change target name if we want to, uh, change target alias, or and then attach to existing target, keep this device unassigned, or create a new one. We do not have any targets and we don't want to make it unassigned, so we'll create a new target for it. Then we go to the device creation after specifying all the settings. The device was successfully created and here it is. After we did that, we can see, we can double check our specified settings and then right click on it and go into replication manager. Over here we want to add the replication. We can choose between synchronous and asynchronous. Asynchronous replication is not active active one and it is usually used for disaster recovery site and, and it wouldn't fit us if we want to build up a cluster. So we go with a synchronous two-way replication. We, can, we click next and here we have to specify the host. Uh, VSN2. So we create a device on VSN1 and we want to replicate it over VSN2 so we specify that. Port number is this by default. You may change it in case if you need for some reason and yeah we also have guidance for that on our knowledge base on the website. If you have any like real configuration questions or some issues, I would recommend you all checking our knowledge base, uh, knowledge base out. Many interesting stuff is described there. So we have an opportunity to create new one or select existing one. This device does not exist yet, so we are going to create a new one. We also can modify target name and target alias here as well. We don't want to do that. Over here, there is an important part where we select synchronization channels and hybrid. I recommend you going over here and before setting up anything in Star Wind Management Console in terms of synchronization and hybrid channels, I always, even if I know for sure, I always double check that. So it's uh, 2230. 2230 is synchronization. And then the second saying, is 40, 20 to 40. So we set that as well. As for the iSCSI, in this, in this setup, we uh, use iSCSI channels as hobby channels also. So it's 10 and, and 20. We set 10 and 20 to serve as heartbeat and click OK. Then we go next. We have a choice between to synchronize those devices or not to. I prefer staying with synchronizing them. So we're doing that, creating our replication, and closing this. There we have it. 
devices are synchronizing right now. Yeah. Okay, they are synchronized. Also, we have a new new information in our console. In this version, you can check the health status of your storage, and it says that this one works fine. So we trust it. Here we have this device. Uh, some of you will ask me, how will we connect that? And here is what I'm going to answer you. We go into iSCSI Initiator and go into Discovery. And after we do that, we have to discover the iSCSI AP addresses and the local one. We go into Targets and then we will see our new targets here. So here's our tap room. Uh, since we are now on VSN1, VSN2 would be the partner connection for us and VSN1 is the local one. So we are connecting it through a loopback IP address. Wait a second. Yeah, actually we are on VSN2 now, since this one says 127.001, I'm sorry. So yeah, VSN2 gets connected locally and you can do it by setting these. So you choose as a local adapter, Microsoft iSCSI initiator, and as a target portal IP 127.001, you press OK, and you press OK one more time. Over here, it will say connected. So this one is partner for us. Then we enable multipath, go Microsoft iSCSI initiator, and we have to set the iSCSI interfaces here. Uh, we would also like to double check that as well. So it's 10, iSCSI 1, and iSCSI 2 is 20. So first connection we do from 10, uh, from 10, 200 to 10, 100, and then we press connect one more time to do the second connection through the second channel, and we go 20 and 20. After we did that, we can click on uh, this device, go into properties, and see two sessions. To make sure we've connected them correctly, we can go into MCS and see that the source portal is 22.10.200 and the target one is 22.10.100. So we did this connection right, as well as this one. After we've done that on this side, we have to do the same thing on the other side. I will pull up the second screen in one minute. Oh, maybe even sooner though. There it is. So here is our Starwind Management Console. We have to open iSCSI Initiator on this side as well. We have to refresh it. And do exactly the same thing. So since we are on VSN1 now, this VSN1 temp room device will be local to us. We will collect it, connect it locally through the loopback AP address. And this Taproom device, which is partnered to us, we will connect through iSCSI AP addresses. So it's 10 to 10, 100 to 200. And once again, it's 20 to 20, 2100 to 2200. Uh, we've done the connection. After that, we have to open disk management. And see our new device over here. So we bring it online. We initialize it as a GBT partition. And then we create a new simple volume. 
which will be called taproom. This is done. It is formatting. It is formatted. So we can close this one and go back to our first VM over here. Open computer management here as well. Uh, go into disk management. We see this device. We bring it online and it will be already Okay, so it is online and it is initialized, also has NTFS file system on it. After we did all that, we have to open failover cluster manager over here and create a cluster. I'm not going to show you how this is done because I'm 100% sure all of you know how to do that. Uh, after we've uh, added and initialized our disk, we go into add disk. We see a newly created one gigabyte device over here. We press OK. It is successfully added to a cluster. In order to use it, it should become a cluster shared volume and we can do that by clicking on add to cluster shared volumes button. It became a cluster shared volume. We can also sign in another name and enjoy working with this device. So here is our device. Uh, unfortunately, it is too small. And if I w would show you how we install a virtual machine inside it and do all the stuff, it would take a very long time. So we have a pre-configured CSV as well as a virtual machine on it. This is a pretty new virtual machine, you can see the uh, Windows RS installation didn't even finish. So I will show you the failover test on that, on this virtual machine. Uh, we are now on uh, host VSN2. So I will pull up the VSN1 screen. Here it is. So this is VSN1. It's 235 its IP address we click here and restart this host restart anyway after that we go back to our host 2 and as you can see virtual machine started preforming uh, automatic live migration it fail over to the second node and kept on running as if nothing happened. But we actually restarted one host. Basically, this is how Starwind works. And I really like the way it does that. Over here in the console, we are getting message that the host is disconnected because it is. Yep, and as soon as that house gets back to us, uh, the fast synchronization will trigger, which will take uh, from one to five seconds per each device to finish the fast synchronization process. Then everything will be synchronized and the system will be ready to face any future possible failures. So this is the configuration, and what I would like you to do is to ask me as many questions as you have, and I'll gladly provide you with as many answers as I know. <laughs> You're always welcome, guys. I'm here to explain stuff. As for the question about video, yes, uh, 
uh, this video will be uploaded to our website in a couple of days and you will be able to review it anytime. As for the steps uh, involved, as for the SMB 3.0, I've already had a tap room a couple weeks ago where I've provided a same step-by-step -step guidance for the SMB 3.0 as well as NFS share. Will it survive a computer server failure? Yes, it will survive any kind of failure as long as it happens to one host. Second host will continue working as should. Uh, as far as how big drive can we build with synchronous replication? Uh, I believe it is something around 16 terabytes, but it is only a limitation per one LUN, so you can uh, build 10 16 terabytes synchronous replications, which will uh, result into 160 terabytes of storage. So I would say there are pretty no limitations in synchronous replication in Starwin. Uh, a good question and how are storage spaces supported? Unfortunately Starwind has not been tested with storage spaces and we do not recommend building up a Starwind infrastructure on top of storage spaces since Starwind doesn't perform well with them. It does work and it works as it should. Everything fails over and everything is right but the, the only thing why we don't recommend setting them is that we never tested in our lab and in our QA department, we never tested Starwind with storage spaces. Uh, a great question from Lewis. Hi. If I disconnect the powers, uh, the uh, if I disconnect the power from the server that has the virtual machine, the virtual machine is turned off. Why? Uh, most possibly, this is because uh, the configure because the misconfiguration issue. In our scenario, if we plug out the power from the server. Uh, the uh, virtual machine will perform a quick migration to another host. It, uh, it's not going to be a live migration as we saw just now. Live migration presumes just virtual machine slides over the other host and anybody who is working with that virtual machine will not feel anything. A uh, quick migration is that, that this virtual machine uh, will be turned off or saved and then migrated to the other host and then will boot up but it has to be online and this issue you just described to me uh, most definitely happens because of the uh, misconfiguration unfortunately. I hope this taproom will help you a lot and this issue uh, won't bash in again. Well, actually, uh, a great question from Thomas. Uh, what's the requirement for underlying storage branch of drives? Uh, can they be can they be under service rate? Uh, sure, they can. So the, the we actually have no requirements for drives since Starwind is 
mainly hardware agnostic, but we have recommendations in terms of which device uh, devices do you use for certain setups and certain drives. This is the only recommendation we have, and uh, well, to the underlying storage. And as for RAID, uh, we recommend using RAID 10 in case of a two-way replication, two-way synchronous replication, and we recommend RAID 0 in case of a three-way synchronous replication. As yeah, so the best way is to use hardware RAID on each server and export it. Yes, absolutely. This is the best way. Uh, sure. A uh, awesome question from Quarry. Can this start as a two-node setup and then expand out to three-node or more? Uh, it definitely can, and this is a great benefit of Starwind, uh, that our setup can be started at two nodes synchronous replication and then be scaled, uh, scaled out up to 64 nodes. So, yes. And all this can be done on a fly without any downtime at all. A uh, great question from Mike. In the event of an OS corruption on one of the hosts, uh, is are there any issues with restarting the OS from backup? Will that mess up the synchronization at all when it comes back online? I am actually not sure because uh, it is impossible to test all possible scenarios of OS corruption and restoring that from backup, but. Either way, if you will be using Starwind and it's going to be a paid one, well, actually, the scenario which I'm showing you right now, uh, if your OS gets corrupted, you restore it, and any any synchronization channels or device settings or anything which can be messed up from Starwind point, our support engineer will gladly assist you with that. That can be also me. It depends who, which engineer will you get. So uh, our engineer will schedule a remote session with you and help you out, out with restoring the configuration of the Starwind on the node which got OS corrupted. Uh, what's the requirement for 16 terabyte drive for synchronous replication? Uh, actually, on our website, we have system requirements uh, which do apply per each drive. So it doesn't really, it doesn't matter what uh, size, what uh, device size do you have in terms of networking. A 16 terabyte drive can be synchronized over one gigabit channel as well but the thing is if you have a 1 gigabit channel with a 16 terabyte drive you must understand that the synchronization process uh, will take some kind of a like three or five days and to increase that speed people use 10 gigabit channel but that's not a requirement that's just logic and and what people want and what people do as for the requirement, the minimal requirement bandwidth of your synchronization channel is one gigabit. Uh, uh, this should be pretty easy. Ethan asked about moving the Starwind cluster into another cluster. We have a great document 
which is called the best practices for the maintenance and configuration changes. Uh, all the all this like uh, almost any reconfiguration and maintenance process is described there I think if you read that one you'll gain many info about your question A uh, great question from Vincent. What is the philosophy of your product? Is it to be able to use JBot? Uh, so our product is able to use any storage that is presented to Starwind host. For example, you have a host and you have a Starwind installed inside it. If you can present any storage, even if a if there will be standing like a real truck and it will be filled up with drives and those drives will somehow be connected to a server where Starwind installed, Starwind will be able to work with it. If you can present storage to Starwind, Starwind can work with it. This is our philosophy. Uh, as for the sync skip speed, as I said, we have the minimum requirement, which is one gig. As for the uh, best practices, we recommend having two synchronization channels, no matter what bandwidth will be. So it's whether it is two gigabits, so one gigabit and one gigabit, whether it's 20 gigabits. But the the important part of this recommendations of this recommendation is that there are two synchronization channels for the redundancy. Uh, you can find all past tap rooms uh, tap room videos on our website. Uh, there is resource library, and in that resource library, there is a video section over there. You can you can easily find all our tap rooms and webinars. SSD cache is only available in paid license as far as I know. Uh, I'm actually not responsible for the licensing in Starwind. Uh, it is a great question to our sales guy. But I think, as far as I know, it is allowed in the free version. And if it's not, you could uh, you could test it anytime by requesting our trial version, which includes uh, all features we have. Yes, SSD cache uh, is a drive for caching needed on all the SAN nodes. Yes, if you want to do SSD cache, there has to be one SSD drive in one node and the other SSD drive in the other node, and both of them will be used for your main device just to boost its speed. Okay, guys, uh, I hope I, I tried my best to answer as many questions as I could, and I hope you enjoyed this tap room uh, because I enjoyed speaking about it and answering your questions and showing you the way everything works. Uh, I want to thank you all and say please come to all my tap rooms and I will do my best to explain you as many things as I know and answer as many questions as you know. Some people were asking uh, me for the uh, general information for our forum, for our customer portal, for our sales. All that information can be found here. So 
Yep. Thank you very much. I wish to see all of you on my next tap room and I wish you a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.